right. Welcome to the 2020 Ask Historians Conference panel, Sinner, Saints, and Spies, Historical Women and Cultural Propaganda. I'm Jennifer borjoli Bennis. I'm the president of School Marm Advisors, a research and fact-checking service for education authors. I'm also Ed History 101, a moderator in Ask Historians, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming you here today. So informally, we've been calling this panel the Women's History Panel, but those two words leave out a whole bunch of what the panelists today are going to be talking about. They won't just be discussing four historical women, but how their lives and legacies were shaped by themselves, the people around them, and future historians. They'll be talking about the changing perception of what it means to be a saint, or where the lines are on what it means to be a sinner, and how women aren't always what they're taken to be. So we're going to be complicating categories. We'll be expanding the boundaries of how women are seen by historians and introducing you to four exceptional and ordinary women. So first up is Dr. Kate Stevenson. Dr. Stevenson earned her PhD in medieval history from Notre Dame in 2019 and has moderated Ask Historians since 2016. She will be presenting her paper, Elizabeth Ackler's Dirty Laundry or the Medieval Saint and Her Suffering Sisters. So hi everybody. This is the story of a saint who tried too hard and the sisters who loved her anyway. It's a little after 1400 in a convent near Reuter, near the intersection of today's Germany, France, and Switzerland. Our heroes are Elizabeth Achler and the other sisters in her convent. They're like nuns with looser rules, so sisters. A friar named Conrad Kugelin and the sisters founded the Reuter, Reuter convent in 1403 to model a new vision of the proper religious life for women. Achler is described as younger, more fragile, and prettier than others. With Conrad's help, she is set on a path to what we call living sainthood. Like all medieval Christians, Conrad and the Reuter sisters believe that God became human as Jesus or Christ and allowed himself to be tortured and crucified in order to atone for humanity's sins. In the late Middle Ages, women who suffer to imitate Christ in specific ways might win the title living saint. They serve as a magnifying glass between other Christians and God. So that's what a saint is. These women aren't play acting. This is an all consuming commitment to an ideal despite and even because of the agony. So kind of like moderating Ask Historians. Our picture of Achler as a living saint comes through a piece of propaganda called a hagiography or a vita. This is a semi-biography that is more concerned with making the subject look like a saint than with historical accuracy. So like mud and violence tell you that a movie setting is medieval. Virginity and not eating tell you, tell you that a late medieval woman is a saint. They're signals rather than observations. So modern scholars study hagiography from the medieval point of view. What did it mean to the person making the claim? What social and cultural conditions enable that claim? Well, Achler's Vita makes it really hard to stick to that methodology. So today I'm just gonna throw that shit right out the window and admit what we all can't help but think when we read about a saint whose miracles include an angel making her bed when nobody else is in the room to see it, and uh, who is so renowned for 15 years of miraculous fasting, but lives in a convent where food disappears from the kitchen. Achler tries so hard to be a saint, but she can only pull it off with the knowing and loving help of the other Reuta sisters. Early German scholarship demonstrated that Conrad wrote and distributed multiple drafts of Achler's Vita in Latin and German shortly after her death. So we'll call the original German one B and the revision M after the manuscripts they're found in. Carl Bielmeier described the tone as somewhat awkward but warm, which is actually one of the better assessments of 15th century German religious literature. Anyway, Conrad and Achler's relationship is just gonna have to be another topic for another day. Today, I want to look at some of the episodes in the Vita in light of both modern skepticism and external medieval evidence. Achler's central miracle, like most late medieval holy women, is her inedia, her miraculous fasting. 
but some of the episodes that Conrad describes in order to prove that her fasting is legitimate line up with episodes in other texts in which holy women actually get caught faking it. For example, in 1512, the sisters at a Munich convent unmask Augsburg holy woman Anna Laminate as a fraud. When Laminate visits them, they watch her, yeah, they watch her throw shit out the window. Um, and they, then they find a stash of food under her bed. So, now there are multiple accounts of this event, including a letter supposedly by Laminate herself that defends her. She says she's tired from the long journey, God allowed her to eat something, um, you know, the Reuda sisters, meanwhile, discover shit on the ground beneath the window in Achler's cell, and then food under her bed. They assume Achler is eating in secret and disposing of her excrement. Conrad insists that the devil is making and then throwing the excrement out the window in order to provoke these suspicions. He's probably including this story to demonstrate Achler's like, brave perseverance and fasting despite the opposition from humans and the devil. But on purpose or on accident, he reveals the other sisters' point of view. They're actually cooperating in this performance of sanctity that they know, from their point of view, is a charade. And this actually comes across even more strongly in what would honestly be the cutest story in medieval hagiography if it wasn't so sad. The comparison here is a case where even the hagiographer has to admit outright that his saint is breaking the unwritten rules. Italian sister Colomba of Rieti was seen stealing food from her convent's kitchen and even eating it. But, her hagiographer explains, the devil forced her down this path and he even forced the food into her mouth. The Reuters sisters similarly see Achler sneaking food. Conrad insists in the Vita that the devil is impersonating Achler. He apparently didn't tell the sisters, so in the original version B, they assume that she is secretly eating, but don't do anything about it. But in M, one day, two pieces of meat go missing. The sisters are discussing where it went. One of them says, oh, where all, what is it? Um, oh, where all the other things disappear. It was taken by our cat with two legs. I love like the emphasis on our cat. It's such a, like, a little sister moment. You know, the sisters added in joke in M could just really easily be just a literary flourish. But the same point lies beneath B's simpler version. Achler's miraculous fasting is impossible without her sisters enabling her. Even though they know from their own perspective as medieval Christians who believe in miraculous fasting that Achler is faking it. So from our point of view now, I hope it's clear that Achler does not have anorexia. Anything we call a psychiatric disorder today is an arbitrarily defined web of physical signs and behaviors that we happen to label an illness. Achler isn't trying to lose weight, and medieval Christians don't see a disease. Living saints are women driven by God to fast extremely and miraculously. At the same time, there is a genetic and physiological pathology underlying today's anorexia nervosa that did exist in the Middle Ages. And this seems to be what Conrad shows us with Achler, including in the stories I've discussed here. She starves herself, but occasionally steals a significant amount of food. What we'd see as severe enough anorexia can actually result in unconscious episodes of binging and possibly purging, which you know we see the um, sisters sometimes overhear vomiting that is followed by Achler crying about how the devil has tried to tempt her to eat. Between the parallel cases and the physiological effects, there seem to be pretty good grounds to just admit it. Whether or not Conrad meant to, his Vita cop captures Achler trying to be a saint. No matter how many times Conrad uses Argvon, or suspicion, Argvon in the modern, to tell about the Reuda sisters, he shows them caring for Achler. They take on the tasks that require someone to leave the convent keeping her and her virginity safe from temptation and rape. They rush to her aid when they hear her vomiting. They do so much extra work to take care of her and to watch over her without complaining that Conrad actually starts to feel sorry for them. In accepting Achler's efforts and failures, rather than insisting on perfection, 
the Reuters sisters end up redefining what they understand as women's sanctity. We can't actually know whether this text is an accurate picture of quote unquote real life at Reuter. In fact, the dramatic details added in the revisions kind of suggest otherwise. But what we have instead is a more or less realistic picture. It makes sense from a modern and skeptical point of view, as well as a medieval supernatural filled worldview. Real or not, there's realistic Vita gives us a realistic view of what it's like to live with a living saint. And so now that I've thoroughly depressed us all by arguing that a really tragic story is realistic, let me close with my second favorite story out of the entire Middle Ages. Another common miracle for late medieval living saints is stigmata, four wounds and you know, the palms and the feet plus one in your side to match the wounds that Christ received on the cross during the crucifixion. Catherine of Siena had mystical, ergo invisible stigmata, Lucia Brocadelli stigmata bled into neat little vials, you know, nice, some of them only bleed some of the time. Well, Achler stigmata bled so much and so often that her sisters had to do her laundry every day. They had to haul it all the way down to the river, even in the middle of winter. And when they washed them, the bloody rinse water ran downstream and the townspeople of Roida started complaining. That is what it was like to live with a living saint in the Middle Ages. Now, I promised you a saint's dirty laundry and I deliver on my promises. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Stevenson. Now we're gonna to transition to Joshua Anthony, who is a second year PhD student in history at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He'll be presenting his paper through Chimel Mountainson's Eyes, A Family History of the Conquest of Mexico. Okay, let's begin. Spanish conquest and colonization in Mexico helped create the modern world, but too often we forget that this was a process experienced by real people with personal consequences. For Chimo Monsin, the colonization of Mexico shattered her world. Chimo Monsin was a Nahua, the majority and dominant ethnic group of the Aztec Empire, as well as a noblewoman. She appeared in a set of historical annals written by a Nahua historian in the early 1600s. This historian, named Chimo Pahin, mentioned Chimo Monsin sparingly and only in relation to her male relatives. Yet, by reorienting the historical narrative containing these annals around Chima Monsin, I reveal her as a woman who wielded impressive power in her life through the context of the family. First, via the pre-conquest Nala system of family politics, and later, by becoming the first woman in her community married in a Christian ceremony. But before I get into the story of her life, let me, pro let me provide some context surrounding pre-conquest Nala kinship practices in elite families. Nala noblemen practiced polygyny, meaning they could marry as many women as they could support and their households were composed of their wives and corresponding sets of children. These women and their children were stratified by class as well as politics. While some of the Lord's wives were the daughters of key allies, others were concubines, captured in battle or purchased in the marketplace. Even among the elite wives, bitter rivalries prevailed. The status of primary wife, the one whose children would inherit, fluctuated with the relative power of the nobleman families. This led to intense competitions over which set of heirs would inherit their father's household. By analyzing the family from Chimo Monsin's point of view, I reconstruct a unique female perspective on the Nahua world as it experienced Spanish conquest. Now, to begin the story of her life. Around the late 1490s, Chimo Monsin was born in a city-state called Tlalmanalco in the region of Chalco, southeast of the Central Valley of Mexico and Tenochtitlan. The midwife who attended Chimo Monsin would have taken her umbilical cord and buried it near the hearth, tying her to the household from her birth. All Nahua women drew their power and identity from their familial households. But Chimo Monsin was special and that her household was the site of power for her entire region. Chimo Monsin's father was a senior lord of Tlalmanalco, the leading city of Chalco. Her family reigned supreme in the region, only surpassed by the Aztecs, or Mexica, as they called themselves, of Tenochtitlan, who had conquered Chalco a generation past. But like all noble households, Chimo Monsin's family was not homogenous. Because of her later marriages, we know she had a noble mother. She would have experienced her own class position at a very young age, as she observed the preferential treatment she received in comparison to her half-siblings, mothered by concubines. The Nahuas were sensitive to the plights of these enslaved women in a way that is quite remarkable for any culture. In the popular pre-conquest Chalco Woman Song, a male performer assumed the role of a concubine, beseeching her all-powerful husband to recognize her pain and her humanity. Chimo Monsi must have heard the song growing up. Perhaps she even saw herself in the song's lyrics, when at the age of seven, her father agreed that she'd be married to an adult man. Her future husband, Weiweo was a lower-ranking lord from a Mecca Mecca, also in Chalco. 
Their marriage conformed to what scholars have termed interdynastic hypogamy, where a superordinate lord married his daughter to a subordinate lord. The marriage granted Wei Weiwei prestige in the protection of Chimamansin's powerful father, who in turn could expect that Chimamansin be automatically made Wei Weiwei's primary wife. At this tender age, Chimamansin must have learned the sometimes difficult truth about noble daughters. They were political tools for the lordly fathers, and disposable ones at that. There is no way I have with which I can reconstruct Chimamansi's relationship with either of her parents. However, there is one particular genre of pre-conquest Nawa rhetorical dialogue, where a noble father gives advice to his pubescent daughter that is quite illuminating. The speaker of one such dialogue warns his daughter not to dishonor his family in a new household, especially by committing adultery. Still, the speaker worries for his daughter. It ends, O dove, O little one, pay close heed. Nawa lords knew their daughters entered dangerous new worlds when they left their parents' households. The Shimamansi would soon discover they'd also achieve powerful new positions. So, around the age of 14, Shimamansi became the primary wife of a middling lord with a local hegemon for a father. Protected by the might of her powerful family, she was promised a life of prosperity and relative peace. Shimamansi had no way of knowing that in 1519, a Spaniard named Hernando Cortes would pass through a Mecca Mecca on his way to Tenochtitlan and change her life forever. Even if she had heard rumors about strange white men sitting off the southeastern coasts, there was enough in her new household to keep her occupied. Before 1519, Chimamansi gave birth to her first child, whose name means green wind in her language. The boy's paternity, however, was controversial, even 100 years later. The Nawa analyst who wrote this account cites the son of another of Weiweo's wives, who claimed that Chimamansi had committed adultery in secret, that green wind was the product of this illicit relationship. Worst of all, this other son claimed that Weiwei knew the truth about Greenwind's parentage, but did nothing, and neither did anybody else. This gossip is an absolute godsend for scholars, because it gives us a crucial hint at Chimamansi's status in the Mecca Mecca. Either she could cheat on her husband openly without any repercussions, or her jealous stepson expected others to believe that his father could not challenge his wife's supposed crime. Whichever possibility was the truth, Chimamansi must have wielded impressive power in the Mecca Mecca. Still, it must have been terrifying for her when Cortez and his army eventually arrived. To satiate the desires of the Spaniards and their indigenous allies, the lords of the Mecca Mecca gave their guests 40 commoner girls, dressed and groomed to appear like nobles. As one of the most impressive noblewomen in a Mecca Mecca herself, Chimamansi was probably involved in selecting these impostors and transforming their appearances. Maybe she sympathized with them as another woman given away to strangers. Maybe she was the kind of woman who would have sacrificed a thousand commoners just to save herself. Whatever the case, Chimamansi's male relatives gave her little time to reflect on the morality of this exchange. Her father, and father-in-law, forged an alliance with Cortes in order to escape the subjugation of the Aztecs, dragging Chaco into the greatest war their world had ever witnessed. They could not have foreseen the horrors that came with Spanish rule, but they themselves would perish before the war ended. By 1520, Chimamansi's husband, father, and father-in-law had all died from diseases brought by the Spaniards. Mexico was conquered while the family ties that sustained Chimamansi's authority undid themselves, leaving her and her son vulnerable as Spanish colonialism took root in their homeland. Now, according to the Spaniards, the polygynous Nahua family was a sinful institution. Evangelizing friars sought to eradicate indigenous traditions and replace them with Christian monogamy, wreaking havoc across Nahua society. Yet, amidst all this chaos, Chumamansi found opportunity. Following the Spanish victory, she wound up as one of the wives of Quetzal Mazat, the younger half-brother of her dead husband. During the war, Quetzal Mazat had emerged as the supreme lord of the Mecca Mecca, with her father dead and now a much more powerful husband than before, Chimamansi can no longer enjoy the coveted position of automatic primary wife. Even worse, Kessel Mazat ruled as a tyrant over his city, refusing to allow Greenland to replace his father as a lord in his own right. Still, Chimamansi's new marriage ensured that Kessel Mazat would not assassinate her son, a fate that awaited much of the survived nobility in a Mecca Mecca. Between 1520 and 1529, Chimamansi bore her second child whose name means Metal Mask in her language. Metal Mask would normally have no hope of succeeding his father. Quetzalmazat had adult sons by women much more elite than Chimamansi, including one connected to the Aztec royal family. But again, these were not normal times. When Franciscan friars induced Quetzalmazat to choose one wife to marry and expel the rest, Chimamansi was the one who remained in his palace. As explanation, the chronicler tells us only that Quetzalmazat's heart fell next to Chimamansi. By this point in her life, she must have known how to manipulate men to get what she wanted. According to Spanish law, her Christian marriage had made Metal Mask the legal heir of the Supreme Lordship of the Mecca Mecca. Chimamansin could thus expect for her two sons, Metal Mask and Greenwind, to rule alongside each other as lords of the Mecca Mecca, as soon as Quetzalmaza died. 
This date finally came in 1548, but once again, fate, fate played Chimamansi a cruel hand. In 1537, the Franciscans had been kicked out of the city, leaving no Christian authority to ensure Metal Mask inherit his father's throne. Instead, an indigenous judge authorized the enthronement of one of Quetzalmazot's half-Aztec sons to the Supreme Lordship. Meanwhile, Greenwind, deprived for years of his lordly position, was finally installed in power. We can imagine Chimamansi feeling bittersweet, celebrating one son's victory while lamenting her other son's defeat. But really, I have no proof that Chimamansi was even there at all. After a Christian marriage, she disappears from the Chronicles account and becomes invisible to the eyes of history. What conclusion should we draw from this story? Recent scholars have demanded we reckon with the conquest of the Americas as a series of cultural traumas inflicted on indigenous people. Yet, we possess precious few sources about actual individual Native Americans, especially from this very early period. And this is doubly true for women. Historians must use the archive carefully and creatively to reconstruct narratives that allow us to reckon with the pain of European colonialism. But when we do, what we find might end up surprising us. Even as the Spaniards attacked the Nahua family, the source of Chimamatsu's identity and power, she made use of Spanish traditions to make a better life for herself and for her children. Chimamatsu was truly a victim of the conquest, but she was also an agent in her own destiny. In the indigenous annals in which she appears, she is the only minor character in a sprawling epic of Nahua men's history, but in her own day, she was larger than life. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks so much, Josh. Next is Ronald James. He's contributed to Ask Historians since 2012 and recently retired from the Nevada Historic Preservation Office. He will be presenting his paper, Sex, Murder, and Myth, How a Soiled Dove Earned Her Heart of Gold. In 1934, George Lyman wrote a book about the glory days of Virginia City, a Nevada mining town of legendary wealth. He described an epidemic in 1859 and how a caring woman a sex worker named Julia Bullett, quote, turned her palace into a hospital, cauldrons of broth and steamers of rice stewed on her stove. Night and day, she went from bed to bed and cabin and tent on her mission of mercy, soothing and comforting, feeding and nursing like a white angel, end quote. Gosh, what a gal, to use the day's vernacular, proving how remarkable she truly was Bullet accomplished all of this four years before she even arrived on the scene, not to mention that there was no epidemic. Bullet came to Virginia City in about 1863, an average sex worker and one of dozens of Cal from California who decided the town was worth the expense of relocating. Most were largely forgotten in the historical record. Disease dogged Bullet's steps, but it was a grisly murder that ended her life. On a cold night in January 1867, she was strangled in her two-room crib. It became the best documented part of her existence. Newspapers published details of her death and funeral, and yet the crime soon receded from public view, replaced with subsequent cycles of news. As with the historical record, local folklore also tended to ignore sex workers, all except Julia Bullett, who was eventually resurrected in oral tradition. Tracing the roots of Bulet's legend is a challenge for want of sources. Several writers, all men, were in positions to remember her, and yet they gave her barely more than a passing nod. The journalist Alf Doton mentioned her a few unremarkable times in his diary. A year after her murder, he wrote about her killer, who had just been caught, an event that was key for this story. Because a man was captured, tried, and hanged for the killing, the community could read visit the slain sex worker, and yet her legacy seemed to sputter. A few years later, Dan DeQuill, another journalist, published a mammoth overview of Virginia City, but he was silent on Bulette and her murderer. Yet another writer, Samuel Clemens, failed to mention her in his classic book about the mining town. He lived in Virginia City when Bulette arrived, even as he picked his gnome de plume, Mark Twain, and yet she is invisible in his roughing it, the tale of his Western sojourn. In 1868, Twain returned to give a lecture, his visit coinciding with the hanging of Bulette's murderer. In a column for the Chicago Republican, he focused on his repulsion over the execution, but he only wrote of Bulette in the context of the murderer. Quote, he secreted himself under the house of a woman of the town, and in the dead watches of the night, he entered her room, knocked her senseless with a billet of wood, and strangled her. So ends Bulette, a nameless, featureless woman of the town. In 1908, an interviewer asked Joe Goodman about Bulette. 
Goodman was the Virginia City editor who had hired Twain as a reporter. Recalling the murder more than 40 years later, Goodman described Ouellette in a generic way with vague, incorrect details. Like others, he fixated on the murder, trial and hangings, events he knew firsthand. His Bulette was a blank slate to be filled in with folklore. During the following years, the image of Bulette changed. The previously quoted Lyman novel advanced the, an extravagant image of her, far removed from fact. Bulette became a soiled dove with a heart of gold. Whether Lyman drew on folklore is impossible to say, but his image of Bulette found an echo in what would emerge in subsequent literature and oral tradition. In 1958, a volume appeared by Zeke Daniels, the pen name of local historian Effie Mona Mack, the first woman to take on the Bulette story. Drawing heavily on Lyman, her Bulette lived in a palace and rode in a gilded carriage wearing costly jewelry and having made much or more than the richest silver barons of the time. As Mack set the stage, she borrowed from Mark Twain's roughing it, celebrating the bold masculinity of the times, filled with men who were not, quote, simpering, dainty, kid-gloved weaklings, but stalwart, muscular, dauntless young braves, brim full of push and energy, and royally endowed with every attribute of peerless and magnificent manhood. This was an imaginary Wild West, a manly West, where men were men and women were few, and yet these manly men were consistently referred to as the boys, for this was also a frontier neverland, a playground of fabulous wealth and eternal youth filled with innocent actors beyond reproach when partaking of vice. In this dreamscape, a few women attended many men, offering the comforts of home and cooking for the hungry, nursing the sick, and providing the tender affection respectably reserved elsewhere for matrimony. All was forgiven for the boys. Even a soiled dove like Julie Blett could find redemption thanks to her kindness. We do not know when the fabulously conceived Bulette became part of local folklore, but it was in full force by the mid 20th century, even before Mac wrote. In 1945, the Virginian Truckee Railroad restored a coach, naming it Julia Bullett, evidence that the long dead sex worker was winning acclaim in the popular mind. Beginning in 1949, the American folklorist Duncan Emmerich was hot on Bulette's trail during his many visits to Virginia City. Recording in a local saloon, he documented aspects of her legend. She was no longer the forgotten sex worker who was murdered, a sideshow to a hanging. Bulette had taken center stage in the drama. All this was happening as Virginia City shifted from mining to tourism. Celebrating local folklore, the owner of the Bucket of Blood Saloon created a fake gravesite for Bulette sometime before the end of the 1950s. The lonely place was across the ravine from the respectable cemetery, for now legend maintained that Bulette was shunned in death and could only find eternal rest in Boot Hill. Her invented grave was guarded by a wooden fence painted bright white so it could be seen through a coin-operated telescope at the back of the bucket of blood. For a nickel, anyone could glimpse the legend and witness the Wild West. The speaker of a tour trolley boomed hourly with her story, and one could hear shopkeepers retelling and embellishing her legends for eager tourists. The process has been unending. A 21st century ghost tour described a local undertaker who refused to yield her body, keeping poor Julia on ice for whatever nefarious purpose until he was finally persuaded to yield the object of his adoration. In addition, people have recently decorated Julia Bullett's fictional grave with keepsakes. Folklore thrives. In 1984, Susan James, my wife, wrote the first real attempt to bust the myth of Julia Bullett. At the time, I was concerned. I too have corrected the record when it comes to local folklore, which colors the past with fantastic wanderings. As a historian, I seek the truth and publish my findings. As a folklorist, I celebrate imagination. Fortunately, I have repeatedly watched the written word fail to undo legend. Folklore is far more powerful than history. There was a real nuanced West of wealth and success, failure and disappointment, filled with people who experienced happiness and sadness and then exited the stage. 
At the same time, the powerful myth of the Wild West dominates popular perception. Ulet survives with a double life. Historians document a woman who thrived in her own way and then was murdered. Popular tradition remembers the queen of the red light district, a symbol of glorious wealth, a time when the boys lived life to its fullest and a woman named Julia Bellette addressed their every need. Both parts coexist, one refusing to yield to the other. In the end, we must not forget that Julia Bellette was a person who relied on an occupation that was too often dangerous and degrading. She was the victim of murder, and yet Virginia City residents and visitors celebrate a life fit into the myth of the Wild West, while the real Julia Bellette has largely disappeared. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. So our last panelist is Dr. Lois Savine, a public humanities scholar with degrees from Harvard, University of Southern California, and UCLA. She will be presenting her paper, When Black History Becomes Multicultural Clickbait, Manure Happens, Uncovering Civil War Spy, Mary Bowser. So spoiler alert, the manure in my title was allegedly piled onto a 19th century black activist, not by a racist mob, but by her closest white ally. However, this never happened. And I'm using this example to talk about how well-intentioned efforts to rupture white male history as usual can inadvertently distort black women's history and even reinscribe racial degradation. So if you type the name Mary Bowser into an internet search engine, you'll get hundreds of thousands of results describing an African-American woman who spied for the union during the American Civil War by posing as a slave in the Confederate White House. Now, this account invokes America's beloved trope of the exceptional hero who succeeds against outstanding odds. And it adds the multicultural twist where the hero is a woman of color. In addition, it can also reinforce a feel-good version of history that ends with emancipation. And there's been a dramatic increase in both print and online accounts of the slave turned civil war spy in recent years, which I think reflects a growing interest in women's history and black history, which I totally celebrate. However, what circulates regarding Mary Bowser is exaggerated or often flagrantly false, even the name Mary Bowser. So there are three problems with this story. One is that celebrating her Civil War espionage often erases the contributions of other free and enslaved Blacks who are part of the same underground. It also obscures her work to contest other forms of white supremacy before and especially after the Civil War. And finally, we cannot celebrate diversity if we are presuming that black history doesn't deserve diligent research and accurate accounts. And I will now confess that my first novel, The Secrets of Mary Bowser, is inspired by the few details I initially knew about her life. But I have always positioned that book as fiction. I continue to research the real figure, Mary Richards Denman. She actually used more than half a dozen surnames during her life, but Richards and Denman are the ones that she used most often. And I'm currently writing a nonfiction book about her. So as her biographer, I'm committed to accurately documenting her life. Now here's a quick bio about the real woman. She was born sometime around 1840 and given the name Mary Jane by her enslavers, the Van Loo's of Richmond, Virginia. Bette Van Loo, an adult member of this family, sent Mary Jane North as a young child to be educated in a free black community and then had her expatriated to serve as a missionary in Liberia. Mary hated it there and she ended up returning to the Van Loo household in 1860. During the Civil War, she and Bette were central figures in Richmond's interracial pro-Union underground. They began by aiding federal soldiers being held prisoner in the Confederate capital and later smuggled intelligence to US military leaders. By the war's end, Mary was teaching the newly emancipated, first in Virginia, then Florida and Georgia. She also became a postbellum activist for racial justice, publicly protesting racism, even as she struggled like other newly freed people with financial insecurity, racist violence and ill health. Each chapter of her amazing life requires a historian to locate an array of primary sources and then contextualize those sources in terms of larger historical movements. And this all got complicated in 1910 when Bette's niece erroneously provided the name Mary Elizabeth Bowser to a reporter writing about Bette for Harper's Magazine. And this is one of many examples in which Mary is mentioned to add color to a story that's really about white spies. And the niece was a young child during the war she said that she'd never really known much about the espionage and nearly 50 years had passed. So it's not surprising that she gets the one detail she says she knows Mary Elizabeth Bowser wrong. Now Mary had married a man named Wilson Bowser in 1861, but she continued to use a variety of other surnames during and after their brief marriage. 
but nearly all subsequent accounts repeat the erroneous name, Mary Elizabeth Bowser, inventing details about her life. And that made it really hard for historians to find the real woman. It would be nearly a century before the Civil War historian, Elizabeth Barron, wrote a biography of Bette Van Loo for which she scrupulously tracked the contributions of many free and enslaved blacks who participated in the Richmond underground. Barron's 2003 book was the first to document details about Mary's life accurately, including her use of the surname Richards, and that really laid the groundwork for my current research. But Barron's nuanced footnoted scholarship doesn't attract audiences who are hungry for Hollywood style cloak and daggery. So instead, new untrue claims are continuing to emerge. One is that while spying in the Confederate White House, Bowser would sew her daily secret reports into Confederate First Lady Verena Davis's dresses, which she then took to a seamstress who would un unsew the reports and give them to Bette Van Loo. Now this Hollywood style espionage is so captivating and American's historical knowledge is so lacking that nobody is stopping to question how somebody who is living as a slave would have the time, the liberty, and the materials to hand sew messages into garments regularly over a period of years undetected by the person wearing those garments, or how an enslaved person would have the power to decide when particular garments belonging to an enslaver would be brought to a seamstress whose services the enslaver would have to contract and pay for. So for example, in 2019, the Washington Post runs an article with the clickbait title, a freed slave became a spy, then she took down the Confederate White House. Now, the Post has a commitment to meticulous journalism, but apparently that does not extend to black history because from its title on, the article is riddled with falsehoods about Mary Bowser, including that whopper about Verena Davis's dresses. The article quotes both Barron and me, although the writer never contacted either one of us, nor does it seem he read our work. Instead, he pulled some quotes out of context from a six-year-old C-SPAN program he watched online. Now, when I contacted this white reporter and his white editor, detailing my concerns about the many errors in the article, their only response was to update the online version to include a reference to the book, Liar, Temptress, Soldier, Spy, a 2014 bestseller that is not about Mary Richards Denman, but about four white women spies. And they even put an audio clip of the white liar author, Karen Abbott, into their Mary Bowser podcast. Now, although Abbott's book is marketed as nonfiction, it is clearly fiction. It is written in invented scenes and dialogues, and it delivers an anachronistic version of white women in the Civil War in which Mary Bowser is once again sporadically added for sensationalistic color. Bette places Bowser as a sleeper agent in the Confederate White House in 1861, where she is activated in 1862 to sow those secret messages. In truth, as Varon's book, which Abbott cites in her bibliography, clearly documents, the Richmond Underground didn't begin smuggling intelligence to Union military leaders until probably late in 1863. Moreover, Bette's own journal, also included in Abbott's bibliography, indicates that Bette and Mary spoke each morning about the intelligence that Mary gathered. And most importantly, according to Mary Richards Denman's own post-war account, her one-time infiltration of the Confederate White House didn't occur until August of 1864. But in Liar's bestseller version of history, Bowser remains in the Davis household for nearly the entire war until, and this is an even more disturbing invention, uh, the Confederates become suspicious of Bowser and according to Abbott, Bet loads Bowser into a wagon and covers her with layer and layer and layer of manure so she can be secretly taken to Philadelphia. Now, this is a particularly demeaning twist on the white savior trope because it sends the message that black activists have to endure the shittiest of treatment, even from their white allies. In this falsified version, as Union troops march into Richmond, Bet thought of Mary Jane, safe up north, a whole new life opening up to her. In truth, Mary Richards Denman spent the entire war in Virginia, and by April of 1865 was back in Richmond teaching the newly emancipated. Notably, Abbott's only source for this dubious seamstressy and the debasing manure are 2013 emails from Bette's great-great-grandnephew, a descendant of the niece who had attested a century earlier that aside from the name Mary Elizabeth Bowser, which was not accurate, she could remember nothing and knew nothing about the black spy. Now these fabrications, now shape what Americans of all races believe. As we can see from a 2018 episode of Uncivil, a podcast intended to upend racism as it, quote, brings you stories that were left out of the official history of the Civil War. Here again, 
the impulse to celebrate black history results in ever more disturbing distortion. Uncivil recirculates debunked claims about Bowser and Van Lu, adding further exaggerations and anachronisms. They don't interview any historians for the episode. Most disturbingly, one of the hosts laughs as she badgers an African-American woman identified as, quote, the great, great, great niece of Mary Elizabeth Bowser into describing the black woman being covered in manure. Now, this exchange would be gratuitously traumatizing even if the story were true. It is all the more so because it never happened, not to Mary Richards Denman, nor to any relative of the woman being forced to recount it. So I started with the assertion that we cannot celebrate black women's history unless we undertake and make visible all of the work that this history requires and deserves to get it right. And I wanna end with a question, which is who benefits when countless inaccurate and degrading accounts that misremember Mary Bowser continue to be created and circulated in print and online. Thanks so much. So thank you very much, all of you, for everything that you shared. And as I heard you talking, I got a sense from all of you that you're fairly passionate about the woman that you're researching and talking about. So I'd be curious, would you mind saying more, each of you, about the personal connection you have to the woman that you're studying? Well, who am I not to talk, right? <laughs> so, um, I, there are two things going on here. First, I mentioned that um, 15th century German religious litter is terrible, and this is true. And my research is essentially trying to figure out why it was so bad and why people read it anyway. So there's the kind of personal mode of going on there. But actually, the way I first got into medieval was through studying holy women. And when I first started reading about the topic, people would say, oh yeah, here's all the wonderful, you know, things that the women who write their own poetry, their own mystical poetry write about. I'm, I'm some against gold on Reddit and that's from Mechthild of Magdeburg, who is a holy woman author. But then the scholars would talk about all this late medieval women's hagiography where, oh, all the stories are the same. They're just the same old tropes. People are starving and getting stigmata and levitating and saying all the same prophecies but nobody actually would publish the texts or translate them. There's not that much that would go into detail about them. And I was so not happy with this. And then, you know, fast forward years and I'm writing, trying to come up with a thesis topic. And I discover that actually German scholars have published some of the German ones, which are almost entirely ignored regardless, online in like 1880. And they're digitized now. And so um, I started reading that, and Achler is one of the um, women that I study, um, that I do actually focus on. My research is broader, but I do study her text. And I just love that laundry story. <laughs> like, this, like, you don't get this. You don't get this elsewhere. It's so, it's so dear. And so anyway, that I just... It, I don't know if it's a personal connection, but it's something that I've always wanted to know about and I finally get to see it for myself. So I can answer the, the question as well. Um, I think I have a similar thing where it's there's one, sim like one little story you find that really is like, makes it, wow, this person come to life. So for me, I came upon Chimel Monsin when I was looking at a different story in the same source, uh, Chimel Pahin's Historical Annals. Um, and I was looking at this project on uh, Nawa masculinity after the conquest. And her husband, her second husband was a big part of that story as the first man from this community to be married in Christian marriage, she's, you know, a hot shot. But it made me think, well, if he's the first man, there also has to be a first woman. You know, what can I find about the woman? And then as I keep on looking in a completely different spot and different chapter of these annals, I find that little, that, that gossip I talked about, the story about, oh, well, maybe her first son wasn't actually um, the son of her, her, her husband, right? And so when I combined those two things, I sort of saw, wow, this woman lived a pretty incredible life and was a woman who was, you know, larger than life. But because of the genre of this account, this is, you know, men's, now a men's history. This policy is, you know, this royal men, the men who lead the community. There wasn't really a place for her to, you know, take part, to become an actual main character. So I thought it would be really fun to, you know, see if I could turn that around. And hopefully it was fun to listen to, too. It was very fun to write. <laughs> For me, it seems that uh, Julia Blett was the subject of my first Comstock lie, the Comstock mining district with Virginia City as the largest community, which famous, is famous for its hoaxes and uh, general 
lying about itself. And when I was five years old, uh, my parents and my my older brother, uh, we all went to up to Virginia City to see the place where Bonanza occurred and where the Cartwrights went for a drink. And we went into the Bucket of Blood Saloon and my father was willing to spend a nickel, which was a big deal, and put it in that, that telescope so that we could all see the grave of Julie Bolette. And he, he looked in it, he found it, he said, there it is. The timer was clicking away on that telescope because it wasn't gonna last forever. My mother looked through it and she said, yes, I see it. I, and then she yielded it to my older brother who looked through and he said, yes, I see it. And then they, they yielded it to me and I could not see it. I, I don't know where it was pointed. I just could not find it. I was only five years old. And the, pre the pressure was intense because they started saying, do you see it, do you see it? Because they weren't gonna put another nickel into the telescope. And finally I said, yes, I see it. And that was my first Comstock lie and it was about Julia Bullett because I didn't see her. <laughs> oh, that's a hard story to top, Ron. <laughs> um, you know, I first learned about Mary Bowser when I was finishing my PhD dissertation. It was 1999, a book called A Shining Thread of Hope by Darlene Clark Hine, who's like the foremother of Black women's history, and Kathleen Thompson had just come out. And this was the first survey of African American women's history. And of course, in 21 years since then, we've seen so much more produced in this field. Um, and so in their like 300 page book, there are about three or four paragraphs about Mary Bowser. And I just thought this was so fascinating. I was writing and teaching about uh, black and white people in the anti-slavery movement. And I thought, well, this was a captivating story and there wasn't enough to write a nonfiction book, but she's a footnote in my dissertation. And I turned her into a novel because I thought that this would be something that people who are outside academia would read. And so I translated my research about African-American women's experience into a novel, but I also fictionalized things. And that let me bring in other historical figures, Harriet and Robert Purvis, uh, Harriet and Dangerfield Newby, uh, Sarah Maps Douglas, David Bastille Bowser. And I loved doing that. But when I was done writing the novel, I kept writing things about the real person. There's a photograph that circulates. And if you put the name Mary Bowser into the internet, you'll see this photograph, even though I debunked years ago that it's of a different woman named Mary Bowser. It's clearly not even from the same time period. Um, but I just kept being really interested in the real person. And at the end of 2018, I came across a letter, the kind that historians dream of and know you will never find, which she writes to Bette. Um, five years after the Civil War ends and three years after she had dropped out of any historical record that anybody had looked at. And she's living in New York. She's got a new last name, so I can discover all of these, you know, intermittent marriages um, and just has exactly the right number of details to confirm. The name's MJ Denman, so I have to confirm that that's the same person as Mary Richards, as Mary Bowser. Um, and since then, I've just been able to discover a lot more documents. It's been wonderful and horrible during the pandemic because it means I have spent a lot of time in digital archives that I had been meaning to get to and not gotten to, but I am, it's breaking my heart because I was supposed to be spending time in actual archives all of this year. And of course we historians don't know when we will get back there. Um, but I think, you know, in the novel, I commit some of the same uh, sins to use the Catholic term that, um, that I complain about in this paper, which is to say like, focusing more on her and maybe erasing some of the other real figures who were actually part of the Richmond underground. And the novel does end with emancipation when actually what's become most interesting to me is her post-war activism. Thank you. And it's, it's fascinating because how all of you mentioned there was this one thing that, you know, being a five-year-old or finding, you know, this, this one small thing that disconnected for you. And I think one of the things I would love to hear you talk about is you know, this, there's this myth of the great man in history. And I think every one of you in different ways mentioned the, a masculine framing somewhere related to um, the woman that you're studying. So I'm wondering when you think about this, you know, the, the great man myth, how has the role of myth impacted how people see or saw the woman you study or I guess I'm kind of wondering about that, the, how to, the connection you see to the myth of the great man and how that connects to your research and to your woman. 
your woman as if, you know, she's yours. <laughs> I don't know, Josh, if you want to start with that, because you, you mentioned uh, the masculine framing in the research that you were doing. So would you mind sharing your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I, I definitely can. So um, I think for me, I had to understand the framing of the great man, that story first, to get the story beyond that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's partly that, you know, the great man I mentioned her second husband, who was the first Christian man. But he's really only a great man to, you know, one guy, the guy writing, <laughs> right? None of us know him. But there are other people that he's connected to that are these great men. Um, for instance, uh, Cortez was the, the godfather of her third son that I mentioned here. Um, and she interacted with all these powerful Franciscans who are famous near the end of her life that were involved in her wedding. And to access like the details about her life, to get inside her mind, I first had to understand these great men. So I can't mm -hmm. ignore the great men. That's just the way that, the way the cookie crumbles, I guess, even though we don't want it to be that way. Um, so yeah, I feel like to look past these great men, you first need to sort of conquer them in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm still working on that, I think. <laughs> I think, you know, part of what gets so distorted with the uh, Mary Bowser versus Mary Richards Denman is that our notion of spying is like James Bond spying. Yeah. So it's, it's not even great man that's appropriate to the time period or <laughs> probably even to what spies are doing in the era when James Bond is supposedly operating. Um, but I think also, you know, I referenced the idea that like Americans love this story of the individual hero who succeeds against outstanding mm -hmm. odds. And that's not really how historical change usually happens, right? And so thinking about how do I talk about the way in which this person's life is the focus and a through line and helps us talk about things like the forcible expatriation of free black people to Liberia in antebellum America without recreating this idea that like it's about her exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. um, one of the false claims made about uh, Mary Bowser is that she had a photographic memory. I have read everything written or written about this woman during her lifetime she definitely had as flawed a memory as any of us. <laughs> um, but I still also want to kind of use her as that through line and yet at the same time show, you know, I think one of the reasons that the underground, the interracial underground in Richmond was so effective is that Richmond was urban and industrialized throughout most of the 19th century, right? So to be enslaved in Richmond was different than being enslaved on a plantation. And one out of five black people in Richmond in the antebellum period was free which meant that there were networks and communities of free and enslaved Blacks that operated for decades in that city. And obviously the underground tapped into those networks. That um, I have a piece coming out in the Georgia Historical Quarterly about an incident after the Civil War, Mary's living in Savannah, Georgia, and she gets arrested for mouthing off about racial profiling by the police. And it's an incredibly contemporarily relevant story. But what I'm interested in is how the documents of the court case, and which gets written about both in white racist newspapers and in a black newspaper that luckily for me started two weeks before she got arrested. So I have a sort of a black media account, um, but that you can through those accounts connect her to a whole network of black activists and their white allies who are fighting for their rights in reconstruction era Georgia. And so I think part of the problem of the they, we don't want to just replace the great man myth with a woman myth because it focuses on this notion of individualism that actually discounts what's going on in history. And, I, you know, obviously I love Kate talking about the sisters and yeah, how the they network. are yeah. <laughs> supporting their, their pretty little saint, <laughs> yeah. a saint wannabe. Their little sister. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was actually going to follow up on there with the idea of not replacing a great man with a great woman with, because of course, you know, I study 15th century Germany, and there is no question that as medieval as I'm going to claim it is, our great man for the era is Luther. And the Protestant Reformation shapes everything that we think about in the 15th century, either from the perspective of pre-Reformation Germany or, you know, the quote unquote waning of the Middle Ages, the end of the Middle Ages. And one of the things that I'm trying to do with my like overall research is actually build a picture, help, help rebuild the picture of religion, religious life and religious culture in 15th century Germany. And I think that we need like women's, but we need those stories of multiple individual women and multiple individual men to do this 
um, in addition to some of the amazing work that's being done right now on archive work on medieval women's or on 15th century women's convents, for example, in Germany. But um, Achler is one case where we actually have some information. And like I said, I don't think it actually gives us, a, the story gives us a picture of the, you know, real life. Um, but I think it does present a realistic picture of what things might have been like for that kind of group of women elsewhere. And to me, that kind of, that sort of like, this is, this is a model that you can maybe extrapolate to different places is almost as powerful as looking at just one person. Fascinating. Thank you. And Lois, you talked about it a little bit. I'd be curious, would you mind sharing more about how your experiences in the archives have changed, not just with the pandemic, but as your time spent with the woman you're studying over time, how have your experiences with the archives changed? In terms of like what research been available to you or what other historians are doing? Well, I think, and probably and this echoes what Kate said, and I think it's probably true for all of us, that the digitization has been incredible mm. because it's, um, it's not just that you can access things from anywhere, but often if things are digitized in ways that they are searchable, you can suddenly find things far faster. Although even when they're not searchable, like you can get through 5,000 Freedmen's Bureau documents in a day, which you couldn't do even if you traveled to the archive where they were, because just pulling them and like going through the pages takes longer. So that's obviously a tremendous difference. But I think also, and it would be interesting to hear um, other folks speak to this in terms of their eras, like the field of African American history is just totally different than it was when I first discovered this figure. There are so many more people who have focused in graduate school on, on this field and who are coming at this field. Like two of the most interesting books I've read recently, um, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh and The Half Has Never Been Told are technically economic histories, but they're economic histories about enslavement and how it, the effects that it had on, on the United States as a whole, as well as on African-Americans in particular. If you had told me I'd be excited about reading economic <laughs> history. <laughs> so I think it's also, um, it's locating the work in the context of, uh, of just emerging scholarship that's helping us to think more deeply about this. I'm, I'm sort of curious because the West has been such a mythologized, folklorized, from bonanza on kind of era to, to hear Ron talk about how that to sort of address the same question of like, yeah. what's changed with what you have access to in the field or things like that. I just want to point out really quickly that you mentioned searchable. So German spelling in the Middle Ages is not standardized, <laughs> even within the same document. So OCR in searching is right. somewhat of, a, of also a folklore, shall we say, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, for the West, it's unfortunately nothing much has changed. It's still a lot of just diving into old books. Uh, it, the Story County Courthouse uh, Recorder's Office has a remarkable collection of, of primary documents and they haven't been digitized and you just simply have to plow through them. Uh, the peculiar thing that you, you find it is that people, are, there's a cottage industry now of, of women historians who are trying to find the real Julia Ballet and, and, and work through all the folklore that's obscured her image. But we wouldn't, they wouldn't be interested in her if it weren't for the folklore. Mm. Uh, there are many more interesting uh, sex workers in Virginia City history, but they just didn't get murdered. And the, the uh -huh. key to the Ballet story isn't, isn't just the great murder, but the fact that mm. this, this French immigrant was captured and hanged for it, even though he insisted all the way to the gallows with, to the priests themselves that he didn't do it. I, I question whether he was the, actually the, the murderer, but it didn't matter. That kept the, that, that formed the basis for the folklore. That's why people try to find her story. There are several uh, brothel owners and sex workers who I, I think are far more interesting and actually made a more lasting contrib contribution to the society. Uh, it's just a peculiarity that folklore led the way to a historical analysis and interest. Josh, how about you? Your, I, I can't imagine what the archive is like for you with your, with your topic. Would you mind sharing more like what, how, what do you look at? How do you, how do, you do what you do? 
<laughs> so, um, so digitization, I would say, with my work is not caught up to where it is perhaps in U.S. history and European history. I think a lot of big reason is um, a lack of lack of funds in places like Mexico and other countries in Latin America. Um, the sources I work with are all written in Nahuatl, which is the language that Chimamanda spoke, the language the Aztecs spoke. Um, and, and I will say um, there's been a change in the last 25-ish years or so where we become more and more interested in these histories and other pieces of writing written by indigenous people for indigenous people, away from Spanish eyes, away from European mm -hmm. eyes, not meant for European consumption. Mm -hmm. And previously we looked at things like the Florentine Codex, you know, familiar with that, a very famous document gave by a Franciscan friar working alongside indigenous informants. But I think now we're starting to realize that there's these texts, like the ones I've worked with, that you have a really interesting look, you know, inside a different world. One where we're, they're not translating things for Spaniards, but they're saying things for themselves. And they're, they're hard texts to get, to get through. The actual language is very difficult, I would say. Um, thank God this text has been translated into Spanish. If, if not, with my level of Nahuatl right now, I could not get through it. But it's also written with very different sort of rhetorical strategies and different sort of organization mm -hmm. that again, doesn't really have a parallel in in the West. But I think what it is in the last 25 years, we become we really started to appreciate rather the importance of taking these unfamiliar views at perhaps familiar topics and in the inherent um, what that gives for the field. Hmm. Huh. Now Ron talked about how the the myth of her murder and someone being convicted kind of influenced her, leg her leg legacy. I'd be curious, did the events around 2012 or, you know, the end of the Mayan calendar, like, did you find the fact that those details kind of seeped into, like, the American cultural norm? Did that kind of influence your research or your access to research? Um... Maybe it's an interesting question. It's funny. Like around 2012, there was definitely like a lot of things published around that, <laughs> calendars and stuff like that. Um, I think it gets people interested. But what what gets me interested, right? And I, I think you're you know you're, you're leading me there really well is the myths associated, right? Like I don't think any Mayan act, right who wrote those these these, these documents that make us think that the world is going to end in 2012 actually really believed it the way we believe it. It's very yeah. different. just the way we sensationalize and translate it to make it accessible for our own consumption to make it relevant to us. I think there's another story, which is what's relevant to the actual writers, right? And I think finding that part yeah. really excites me, gets me hyped to do history. So you've, you've got me thinking about something kind of that connects yours and what Kate was talking about. And that is kind of the obligation to how you think the woman you study saw the world versus how we see the world today. So Lois, could you say more about that? Like how you see your obligation to marry versus marry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's tremendous. And I think it's clear that black women's history is important to every American because it is all of our history, but it's especially important to people who feel a close personal connection to it. And I wanna honor that and I wanna support that and I wanna engage with that but also get people to understand that we have to think about these things in terms of the time period in which somebody mm -hmm. lived and understand it not through our experience of race and gender, although it is totally relevant. Did I mention that you got arrested for mouthing <laughs> off about racial yeah. profiling by the police? I mean, like that, the whole <laughs> article about that erase, arrest from 1868 is basically everything is the same. Yeah. Um, but that on the other hand, it is really important to understand this. And I think the rhetorical strategies, as Josh mentioned it, are also relevant. So when Mary talks about her Civil War espionage after the war, which she does in private correspondence, in public talks, there are newspaper articles that reference it. Every time she talks about it, she's not saying, look at what I did during the Civil <laughs> War. She's saying, you should trust me. I was an agent of the government during the Civil War, and I know bad when I see it. And here's the bad stuff that's going on now. And she was trying to get black people and white people post-Civil War to become more active in ensuring racial justice. That we, emancipation doesn't mean anything until we have full citizenship, right? Huh. So like, it's interesting to think about her rhetorical strategies because she will say whatever she thinks is going to motivate the audience to do <laughs> what she thinks they need to do. So sometimes she talks about, she doesn't name Bet when she's speaking publicly, 
but sometimes she'll talk about these wonderful white women that she worked with uh, in a particular house in Richmond during the Civil War, and you can tell it's the Van Loos. And sometimes she'll talk about the horrible people who had uh, enslaved her. And it's the same family. And I think that she's doing that because she's testing out rhetorical strategies. And so having people understand when you look at a historical document, and this is the danger of digitization, anybody can find anything, but do they understand how to read it? So um, in that same Uncivil podcast, they talk about the headline of an article from 1865, and they clearly haven't read the article because they get the information wrong. But the headline says, talks by a colored lady and Henry Ward Beecher. And the um, person gets really upset because they say, see, she's already being erased from history. They don't use her name. Well, actually, it's describing a talk she gave using a pseudonym, Richmonia St. Pierre. So it's not like it would have made her more better known as Mary Richards if they had used that name. Um, but that a, putting a colored lady first was an incredible honor. A black woman was being referred to as a lady and she was getting billing over Henry Ward Beecher who was one of the most famous men in America. So they were actually elevating her over Henry Ward Beecher. But the person who's talking about the article hasn't read the article, they yeah. saw the headline because I used it in a slide in a talk that I had given that one of them had come to, didn't know how to read it in that context. And I think that that is also Again, it's really tricky. I want people to be excited about this history. I want to make it as accessible as possible. And I do not want there to be a thing where if you have a PhD from this kind of institution, <laughs> you can truly understand history and the rest of you have to just let us interpret it. But I guess that's my own uh, Protestant Reformation. <laughs> I want to make it directly accessible to people, but also to help people understand. I mean, even, you know, Slavery lasted in what became the United States for centuries. And it was really different in different time periods and different places. As I said, enslavement in Richmond, mm -hmm. Virginia was really different even than enslavement in other parts of Virginia at the same time period. And so thinking about historical specificity, because we all know the past is one big time. It just yeah. happened back there, one <laughs> okay. big time. Oh, yes, one big time. Okay, but you're not being Protestant here. You're being 15th century Christian <laughs> because the only reason that Luther could get away with promoting, you know, Das Wort God as the, the word of God as the Bible is that there have already been like 23 editions of the Bible published in German, in Germany by 1500, that priests are just reading the Bible out loud to people in German during the sermons, but even more so than like the actual Bibles, there's all this quote unquote biblical literature. So books you can buy have passages from the Bible, except they're, they're kind of remixed to be in the order that you'd actually hear them in church, like day by day, and people are reading Psalms, and Luther's message is attractive in part because people already have access to the Word of God, and they want more of it. So, just correcting the record <laughs> for my that, that is... study. That is fascinating, and I'm happy to be educated by you, even though I never thought anybody would call me a 15th century Christian. There you go. I, I mean, you're not doing all the other weird stuff, and we can go into that some other time, because I study the most alien and awesome stuff. Yeah. So, Kate, I, there's two things I'm struck with between you and Ron. So, Ron, you used a phrase sex worker, which to me is very much a 21st century framing of a particular type of transaction. And Kate, I wanna think of Elizabeth as a teenager. So I, as someone in 2020, I appreciate that Ron at used modern day language to help me understand someone from the past. But my thinking, Kate, is that I'm being disrespectful to her if I think of her as just a teenager doing what teenagers did. So I'm wondering if you two could help me kind of reconcile those tensions between modern language and historical framing. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that I could point out is that for most of the events I'm discussing here, Achler was in her 20s. Oh, she dies, college she dies kid. at age 30. She dies in oh. 1420 at age 34. Um, she's actually is a teenager when Reuter is founded and probably, probably, she's probably 16 or 18. But she's definitely, um, but she's older for most of the events. And one of the things that I didn't go into talking about was, you know, I've only talked about the hagiography and Conrad's point of view, but we actually find her remembered 100 years later and even 250 years later in records from a different convent. She's remembered as this wonderful, brilliant teacher and a really, a really important like mentor figure 
so the picture that Connor is giving us isn't total. I have some thoughts on why, but that's neither here nor there for today. So on one hand, I think that Conrad is probably trying to give us a picture of her as younger and more docile and not threatening in contrast to some of the more powerful portrayals of holy women at the time. But I also think that there is a certain element of her sisters having to take care of her in which case you can see, like, you know, I describe it as a little sister dynamic and that kind of thing operates. And that's one of the, in this particular, like a uh, convent situation, a group of all women who are more or less a self-chosen com community that their own dynamics are not the same as our dynamics today. And that that's how one of the reasons that, so instead of trying to use modern to understand the medieval there, that's one place where we can use the medieval to re rethink the modern. Oh, right? that's interesting. Thanks. Ron? And for me, the, the, well, the vocabulary is a tough one. Uh, there are obviously a lot of words that are used for it, it, to describe women engaged in sexual commerce uh, of all the different periods. But for our period, uh, there, there were many terms. They meant various th things. Some of them were offensive at the time uh, and der derogatory to the, to the women engaged in that occupation. And some of them have become more derogatory over time. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm assuming and I'm hoping that, that some modern sex workers might very well click into this and, and they don't need to, be confronted by terms that that would they would find hurtful. I, I whatever term you were to use for Julia Bellet might not be appropriate for various periods of her occupation. I, I suspect that when she arrived on the scene in 1863, she was an experienced woman in the industry. Uh, she did probably casual relations with many men, because that's what one did. At some point, she became the favorite of uh, the head of the uh, Liberty Engine Company number one, uh, to which she actually became an honorary member. Uh, he was a, a local tough who uh, was, had some, uh, you know, kind of a notorious reputation in his own right, but he probably kept her uh, financially secure perhaps without additional customers for a while. He died a year before she died. She was seeing a doctor and was on the downhill slope, uh, seeing this doctor regularly. She had some very bad disease that was probably going to kill her very soon. And then she was murdered. After her, her uh, favorite died, was uh, in a bar fight, uh, she uh, probably resorted to more uh, casual relationship with many men. So you could you could call her many different things throughout her career. It's it's a tough one, uh, but I think that the, you want accuracy, and no single term would be accurate for her entire career. And you want something that isn't going to be hurtful for the, uh, for women who I hope will become part of our audience and and are engaged in sexual commerce in her own right today. And that's such a powerful tension that you're speaking to between the need for accuracy, historical accuracy, but respect for the modern reader. And I'm deeply grateful to all four of you for modeling what that looks like and kind of finding that balance. So I was wondering as kind of to close out our conversation, if you wouldn't mind sharing or kind of discussing amongst you, any advice you'd have for someone who's new to reading about a woman in history? Because on one hand, we have women's history, which is a field unto itself. But then we have Civil War history, we have medieval history, and we have the history of you know, the Nahas. So how do we, any advice for a reader to think about women's history and a period of history? So... I think for me, you know, one of my big tensions is where do I publish? I mentioned I have wow. this article coming out in Georgia Historical Quarterly. It's rigorously footnoted, like Liz Barron's book about Bette Van Lu. Um, but I have to wait for it to come out. Like I handed in my revisions literally the week that George Floyd was murdered. And it's, I, I feel the tension of how interested people would be in hearing this story and thinking about it through everything that we're seeing around the activism related to police brutality all summer. But Academic journals take a long time to come out. Mm. I have published other things about Mary Richards Denman in places like the LA Review of Books and Time, 
which people can find online for free and anybody can access, but they don't have footnotes, they have links, right? So how does somebody tell the difference between a rigorously researched piece and a Washington Post article, which you think you read it in the Washington Post, it must be true. And then when I said to the writer for the Washington Post, like, didn't it seem strange to you that we could know these details about Mary's life? Like, he clearly had gotten the 2014 bestseller book, but hadn't looked at the footnotes. So I would say like the most important thing I would like to imbue people who are interested in history is look at the footnotes, look at the sources. <laughs> and once one thing gets published, so now anybody can cite that 2014 bestseller and it's a published book from a major publishing house who has published me, so I can't diss them too much, right? But that their understanding, like what's the question I need to ask to understand this? Like to get a needle and thread like a needle and thread we think of as cheap and easy to access, but in, during the Civil War and even in the period after the Civil War, those were really hard to get, let alone the time to hand. So like if you ever have to sew on a button, you know how we, you curse under your breath, right? So like just trying to understand what's the critical thinking I need to do about either the claims that are being made or understanding, as I said earlier, the primary sources and really trying to think about I'm, I think my biggest gift as a historian is like, I'm endlessly curious and I am often doubting. <laughs> and I think that both being curious, but not just being satisfied when you find the answer, especially if you find it on our frenemy, the internet, but also being um, a little bit dubious about how is it that we could know this about the past? I think that makes us better historians. But my co-panelists probably have other great things to add. <laughs> Well, if I could chime in about sort of the tension right between women's history as a subfield and other sort of more, more time and space based things, colonial Mexico as a subfield, for instance. Um, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that I don't think it's good to have very strict boundaries between these things. I think we need that for professional purposes, but in terms of what we research when we look at it, kind oh. of, right? Um, I mean, I think I've seen this is a problem. I think we're so we're getting word that's becoming more more unacceptable, unacceptable in our field, right? But even if you're not talking about women's history, if you're not a women's historian, if you don't mention women in your history, you're leaving out half the population. That's just bad, history, right? So if you're just getting into history and you're um, getting into reading history and you are interested in women's history, I think you sort of think about that. You know, don't feel don't feel you know restricted to a couple different kinds of things, um, and sort of what I try to do anyway is you know be open, right? Be open and expect to find women everywhere because they are everywhere. And if they're not there, that's probably a bad reason for that. Yeah. yeah. I agree with Josh and having an integrated history, uh, practically at gunpoint was forced to uh, co-edit the, uh, the volume called Comstock Women, The Making of a Mining Community, uh, because a, a very powerful uh, woman uh, politician uh, found out I was doing uh, an article, an overview of, of women demographically in the area as a background for the overview history of Virginia City that I was writing, The, the Roar and the Silence. And she said, you will write something on Comstock women. And I said, well, let's do a collection of articles. I, 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 the articles are written by some brilliant authors and, and they offer a lot of different perspectives, but ultimately, I, I wanted to take their conclusions and integrate them into the overall history because it's good to have the, the individual study of women and various women topics, uh, topics that deal with women's special circumstance and experience. That's a great thing to have. I'm very pleased that that volume exists. But I'm equally pleased that I was able to integrate with those women fully into the history of Virginia City and not allow it to become a manly, ma manly, manly West, a uh, wild West. <laughs> you know, that's, that is the wrong way to, to be perceiving any region. And, uh, and too often the history of the West has been very masculine. And I, I think it was, from my point of view, to simply see it integrated was critical and key to, to having a better history that included everyone. And, and I, the history of the West, I think also is very, is told in America as a very white story, when it, mm. it clearly is a very multicultural story, not just natives, but uh, African-Americans free and enslaved. And uh, the population that we refer to as Mexican now in different time periods. Mm. True. And Chinese Americans. Yeah. Oh yeah. Were a very big part of the West. 
So I'm wondering if there's a way to wrap up, and we can go backwards this time, um, starting with you, Lois. If you wouldn't mind just sharing, if you have one or two you know, more thoughts that you want to share with anyone who joins us today. So we're just going to go backwards chronologically this time. So any final thoughts? I think, again, a lot of what we've already stressed. One is the, the need for accuracy, the need for the right amount of specificity, but also an understanding of how much both what has happened in the past and how we talk about circulate the stories of what has happened in the past is actually really relevant to us today. And obviously mm -hmm. when you write about intersections of race and gender in the United States, that feels incredibly uh, relevant today. I mean, uh, you know, I I'm not academically affiliated, so I take my books out of the public library and lots of the books that I take out of the public library sit in my house for months and months and sometimes years and years. And our, we, have, we don't have enough library space in our city. So it's, it's a gift to, that I do that for the library. But all of a sudden this summer, I have seen the number of hold requests for books that have sat in my house for a year, like 17 holds on them. And I think it really is because of the energy around the Black Lives Matter movement. So on the one hand, to keep a sense of how we need to see the through line of what's going on around, as I said, police brutality in America today through the history of who was policed, including, uh, as Ron reminded us, the Chinese women who are all characterized as sex workers or prostitutes in the West. Um, but to think about those connections, I think is really important. And again, the question I ended my paper with, right? Like, who benefits? It's clear that people are circulating lousy information because they want more clicks on their title. They want mm. people to listen to their podcasts. They want a book that's going to be a bestseller. They want to feel like they're being good multiculturalists by including Black history and Black women's history. But really, like, if you're not getting it right, then what is the harm that you're doing and who's benefiting from that harm being done? So that, I'll, I'll, like a good historian, I'll leave with a question and not a statement. <laughs> Thank you. Ron, any parting thoughts? Well, I, uh, you know, obviously my topic is all about how folklore changed the image of a very real person. I think that in general, uh, history has a way of becoming unmoored, whether it's by people who take liberties intentionally and write something that is not justified by the primary source or because the folk take liberties and, and completely unmoor the topic and embrace it with, with their own legendary uh, context. Uh, maybe women sometimes, uh, and certainly everyday people, can be extremely vulnerable to that as, as time goes by. It's something we have to be aware of from my point of view, it's something we can also celebrate, but untangling it is, is really important. And, and I, I, having, a, a, having a, a basis for understanding what the real person is all about, and all of us had that real person, but all of us also had a real person who then was uh, unmoored from the, the reality. And, and being able to to sort all that out could be a real tricky process, but it can also be a great deal of fun, obviously. Thanks. Josh? Okay, so my presentation was about, I think what I really was trying to do here was find a way to deal with the pain of European colonialism, right? To tell a different story and to interact with this and understand this better. But I think it'd be remiss to mention that, you know, most of our family died to disease right now being racked by disease in this world that is disproportionately affecting the world's um, disadvantaged populations, especially indigenous people in the United States and around the Americas. And so if I know we've all, you know, talked about or seen on the news of where to donate, uh, please consider donating to there's many amazing uh, foundations set up for indigenous people by indigenous people. Um, so just if anyone listening to this might want to consider that, that'd be making me really, really happy. Thanks. And Kate, you want to wrap us up? Yeah, all right. I got two things. First is read medieval women's writing for yourself. We don't have Ockler's voice. That's lost. But as I mentioned, my username, Sun Against Gold, that's from Mechthild of Magdeburg writing about God. You shine into my soul like the sun against gold. Read the stuff that's out there. Read Mechthild, read Hodwig, read Marjorie Kemp, read what you can get. Most of these have English translations. 
Um, but the second thing, I just want to bring us all back to uh, Ron's point about how power, how folklore is more powerful than history in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think where I'm talking about texts, not oral tradition. But um, you know, I've talked about today about how Elizabeth Achler is the saint who's faking it. Well, she was beatified by the Catholic Church in 1766, which I think is a pretty powerful statement of the success yeah. of Achler, Conrad, and of her sisters, and of the triumph of tradition. Oh, very true. Thank you. Thank you so much, all four of you. Thank you very, very much for your time. And this concludes our panels on saints and sinners and spies. Oh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody.